Uh, my name is Jean Bosco Mutangana. I'm a national prosecutor and I also head the International Crimes Unit in the Office of the Prosecutor General. When I joined the prosecution 16 years ago, my, our office was already working with the ICTR at that time on, on, on various occasions pertaining to the ICTR's investigations in Rwanda. Um, I was not directly involved at that time, uh, but I would say uh, I personally started working with the ICTR from 2004, 11 years ago. In 2004, what were, what were your initial impressions of the ICTR? Well, at that time, there were a number of cases that were going on, uh, a number of investigations that were going on. And uh, the, the ICTR at that time was involved in lots of uh, locating witnesses in Rwanda, uh, seeking office of the prosecutor, was seeking uh, assistance from our office, from the office of the prosecutor. Uh, we had started already establishing the fugitives tracking unit in our office. And um, a few years, maybe around 2007, we, we got the uh, establishment of the Fugitive Striking Unit, uh, which started directly working with the ICTL, and I was the head of that unit at that time. So we started to make our first uh, applications for the transfer of cases from the ICTL to Rwanda. And the Office of the Prosecutor in Rwanda submitted the applications for Amicus Korea. Uh, to appear before the, the ICTR and uh, support the request for um, our request for, for the transfer of cases to Rwanda under 11 bis uh, rules of procedure and evidence. So I would say from 2007, I personally started having uh, um, an engagement with the ICTR on the basis of applications that were being made here uh, in Arusha and, and also most importantly, working with the OTP. But we also worked with the registrar's office to a certain extent, but most cases worked with the OTP. Your involvement in tracking and locating the fugitives, what, what, what were the challenges involved in that? Well, there's a number of challenges. First of all, uh, the, those who committed genocide in Rwanda, my, uh, quite a number of them um, living in the Western capitals and a number of African countries as well. So the first challenge that we, we, we have is um, a number of countries take a very slow pace at reacting to the indictments and arrest warrants that we have issued. And uh, of course, that is also uh, connected to the conduct of the fugitives themselves because they change names, they cross from one country to another, especially in the Europe in the European countries, where the, especially in the Schengen area, where they cross from one country to another, they change names, they change addresses. In Africa, especially, they don't even have addresses because most of the addresses are not marked. The borders are porous, so you, you start tracking a fugitive in one country and he runs to another country. So, of course, that is there is a lot of challenges that has been going on. But besides that. There has been some success also on the other side because we have managed to secure some extraditions and, dep and deportations from a number of countries as well as the transfers from the ICTR. But could you maybe give an example of one of, one of the uh, more successful uh, moments? We successfully received two cases from the ICTR, uh, transferred to Rwanda for trial before the national courts, and all this went through the trial and the appeals chambers. That is very significant. Uh, of, also in recognition of the international tribunal, in recognition of, of the Rwandan judiciary's and prosecution's ability to conduct a successful prosecution. Uh, on the other side, we have received uh, three cases. We received a case from Denmark. We received a case from Sweden. And these two particular cases actually went all the way, exhausting the national uh, jurisdictions, exploiting all the national channels, the domestic channels in the countries where they lived, and going all the way to the European Court on Human Rights. And the European Court decided to send these cases to Rwanda on, on, on the point that Rwanda is capable and able to conduct 
uh, trials before uh, the, the, the courts in Rwanda. So there was no issue of uh, abuse of human rights in criminal proceedings because the European Court was satisfied that Rwanda is able to conduct a fair trial. And indeed, we are conducting trials before the Rwandan High Court Chamber for International Crimes and uh, prosecutors before the High Court are specialized prosecutors in the International Crimes Unit. Uh, so I, uh, I would say that uh, a number of cases that we have received both from the ICT and from other jurisdictions uh, are going on well. We also received a deportation case from Canada that has been going on. And some of those cases that were extradited from Europe, one, one of the cases is already completed at the trial level, and, and the other one from Canada is also completed at the trial level, whereas uh, the other ones from, uh, from the ICTL, so, um, one is also completed at trial level, and the other one is still ongoing. So there is a significant progress in, in the work that we are doing to have the prosecution of international crimes before the national courts. How would you characterize Rwanda's relationship with the ICTR? Uh, well, I'll speak on behalf of the prosecution because that's where I work and I don't speak on behalf of the government. But I would say a relationship that has been going on for over 20 years, you won't expect it to be a straight line. That is one. You, there, there, there have to be some hiccups in, in one way or another. It's, it's like staying, even a personal relationship with an individual will have some, some hiccups itself. So uh, I would say from the cooperation point of view, uh, the, 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 the relationship has been significantly moving on well because what we have been looking at is to have justice, to see justice being done to the victims of the genocide and to the people who are suspected to have committed genocide. And this has worked to a certain extent, uh, whereby uh, as prosecutors we would say uh, the ICTR has done uh, a commendable job in trying those of the most key suspects, the architects of the genocide. Though the number is still big, but in their existence for the last 21 years, they have been able to track and arrest government ministers, military officers, businessmen, the clergymen, uh, key individuals within the, who played a big role in the genocide. And, and I think that uh, the establishment of the tribunal itself, uh, regardless of the numbers of those prosecuted, uh, but the international community has managed to send a very clear message to those who don't value the human life. So coming back to the relationship, uh, I would say that um, even the Registrar Majola yesterday at, uh, at the meeting said that Rwanda supported the ICTL to achieve its goals. So I would say, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, say that it was a straight line, but it worked. It worked. A 20-year relationship cannot be 100% uh, smooth because you have... 11 million Rwandans, some of them are not happy with what the ICTR is doing. Some of them are critical of what the ICTR has been doing in terms of even uh, decisions. The civil society, the individuals, the genocide survivors organizations have been dismayed by the decisions. And uh, sometimes they have actually demonstrated and said, this is not how it should be. But uh, looking from that context, also you have to see uh, what we call justice, because if justice has to be dispensed, you would not expect um, you would not expect the prosecution to win all the cases it has come up with. You would expect to, to to have the prosecution losing some cases. So in this in this context, it is clear as as a lawyer and as a criminal law, lawyer, I would I, I would understand what the ICTL did, but a layman wouldn't understand it especially when it comes to decision-making by judges, you not expect the judges to, to only 100% deliver uh, convictions to, to the cases they are handling. So I would say that uh, it has been uh, a working relationship with some challenges, but the challenges that we managed to go through, the difficult waters and managed to reach at this stage when the ICTR has concluded its mandate with securing a number of convictions and 
some of them are very serious convictions with the life sentences over 30 years imprisonment. Uh, they have secured the conviction of a uh, former government prime minister. They have come up with very important jurisprudence and case law uh, with relation to rape as a crime of, of genocide and giving very clear definitions of, of all that. So the, the jurisprudence that has been provided is a very big contribution to international criminal law and for future generations. So we don't look at also the, the, only the relationship in terms of, of the trials. Mm -hmm. We also look at the relationship in terms of the legacy of the ICTR, which I personally think that uh, a lot of contribution has been made despite some challenges on the way. Looking back, is, are there things that you wish had been done differently by the ICTR? Uh, well, uh, I would have preferred the tribunal to be located in Kigali, first of all, to be located in Rwanda, to uh, be at the scene of crime, where the crimes were committed, and to have, first of all, that would even be cheap for the ICTL. If it was located in Kigali, they, would have, they wouldn't have to transport witnesses from one country to another. And they would also leave a legacy of developing the national institutions, the prosecution, the courts, the bar association, and the civil society. So uh, I would have wished to have the ICT located in Kigali in the first place. When the Security Council established it in 1994, Resolution 955 of 1994, uh, it would have been better if they also talked about the seat being in Kigali for the purpose of uh, developing the national institutions. Because now the ICT has been in Arusha for the last 21 years. and. I'm sure some of their judges have not been to Rwanda even. So, and, and I don't see that as an advantage to anyone because uh, in Rwanda we have genocide memorials, we have places where there are mass graves, we have people who are ready to cooperate the electorate with the ICTL but who are not able to make it to this place. So that is one. Another thing I would have loved to see uh, the ICTL um, archives transferred to Rwanda, because this is the Rwandan history. And to have Rwanda as the center or the hub of research for these archives, because a lot of information has been collected, evidence, audio, visual recordings, that relate to the evidence that has been used before the court here. Uh, having these archives brought to Rwanda would be a very important legacy, not only uh, to the international criminal law for the researchers, the academicians, but also directly Rwanda benefiting from this, because this is part of our history that we would love to see uh, these archives being here. So that is that is my wish. But uh, the policy makers and decision makers may, may as well decide on where these archives will go. But as as a, a legacy for our country, for Rwanda, then we should have these archives coming to Rwanda. On the issue of reconciliation, Rwanda has 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 gone ahead. It's the reconciliation uh, process that has been going on for the last 21 years is remarkable, and the people of Rwanda are more united than they were united for so many years. But from 1994, despite what we went through, the atrocity crimes committed in the genocide, uh, the social fabric broken up because of the genocide, uh, leaving behind orphans and widows, it was very there was a challenge. But the government has um, come up with a, a, a leadership style that unites the people of Rwanda, that promotes the lives of the people of Rwanda, that cares for the, the, the genocide survivors, that builds the nation. That the, and the, 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 there has been a, a, a remarkable social and economic transformation in the country and an atmosphere allowing reconciliation to grow. So I would say that um, reconciliation is, is an ongoing process. It takes time, but in Rwanda it's remarkable. And, uh, and uh, I would say that uh, Rwanda has been at the forefront of, of reconciling a people that so the genocide lived in it because there has been convicts who have been released from the prison and they have joined the families of the victims and the survivors and they live together on the same hills and they are working together 
in, in clubs, in, 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 in their lifestyles. So there is no question about that. All I can say that there has been justice going on, and justice is one of the pillars of reconciliation because we have seen courts uh, in Rwanda, both traditional gachacha courts and the classic courts, doing the job that has also been sending a message of reconciliation. We have seen politicians teaching reconciliation amongst the people. We have seen all the efforts in place bringing back the people together. Now, on the issue of uh, the convicts who are fearful, uh, from my point of view is that people who have been raised by the tribunal or served their sentences uh, are welcome to come to Rwanda, but they have to go through the migration and uh, ask, apply for the documents, bring them back home. Because as, as a principle of law, you cannot be tried twice for, for, for the same crimes with the same facts. That's, that's a principle of law. Uh, non bis in idem, you know, you, know, you know what it means. It's, you, you, the, if the tribunal has acquitted you and all the due process of law has been respected, there is no other court that can put you on trial on the same crime and same facts, unless it's a different crime and different facts. Second, being fearful to come to Rwanda is, uh, is a personal uh, experience of, of those people. So they, they, they could come and, and live because we have hundreds and thousands of people who are released from the Rwandan prisons who even confess their crimes, who are now living with other people in the community. So, and, th and those are very many, actually, more than uh, the ones who are here. So, so I don't see why uh, that, that should be a problem. They should follow the, the immigration procedures, apply for papers to travel to Rwanda, uh, and live as Rwandans and contribute, give their contribution to the nation building. Because there are so many Rwandans in the country who have been convicted, sentenced and served their sentences, and are now back in the communities living with the, the people who actually survived the genocide. So that is, uh, that is their personal observance, but their personal observance is, uh, is actually very personal, and, um, and I, don't, I don't see it the way they see it. I don't see this the way they see it. They are, I think, to me, even if I'm not an immigration office, official, but I would say... They would, they would be able to come. They have families there, and they have relatives, and and probably they have their property there. So they could come and uh, and, and go and live in the country as other free Rwandans, because their trials have been held, and uh, and, and and that means that uh, according to the principles of criminal law, you cannot be tried twice for the same crime or the same facts. Unless new facts come to light, perhaps. Well, that would also. Uh, would depend whether the, the facts are actually new. Because if they are new, and uh, if the crime is new, because it also has to go with the crime. But uh, I don't see any modern classic jurisdiction uh, committing someone who has been acquitted by a competent tribunal, whereby he has been given the right to defend himself, whereby the prosecution has given evidence and decisions made uh, to be fearful of returning to the country. So they must be uh, knowing how to come to the country. So unless they think that they have committed other crimes that have not been brought to light, that is a different issue. But uh, for that one, I'm non-committal, because what I'm talking about is, has the procedure of the charges been exploited before the tribunal, before the ICTR? Has the appeals been e e exhausted by the prosecution and, and themselves? So if, have they served the sentences for the crimes to which they were indicted? And, and if this has been done and, uh, and all the due process of law has been respected on a particular crime, then, uh, then I think to me uh, those people are free to come and live in the country instead of ro roaming around. So, But all they have to do is to of course, coming into the country requires a certain procedure. They can follow that procedure. So it is really too much of their personal feelings that one cannot tell. But speaking from the legal, criminal law point of view, that is how I understand it. How are you feeling about the future of Rwanda right now? The future of Rwanda is very bright. 
Rwanda is a country that has moved from a very difficult time, passed through the very difficult moments of war and conflict and genocide, and emerged as a winner in rebuilding the country. So Rwanda is a successful story. It's a country that is uh, governed by the principles of the rule of law. Uh, it's a democracy. It's the people of Rwanda really have identified themselves as Rwandans to move ahead as Rwandans and to build their nation and to make sure that they transform the lives of the people of Rwanda. So there's a lot of success stories and uh, I, I can't go into each, each one of them, but uh, Rwanda recently, I was reading the newspapers that has been ranked, I think, the, the seventh in the whole world, having good governance and good principles. Yeah, the city of Kigali has been ranked the best beautiful city, clean city in Africa, probably one of the best beautiful cities in the whole world. Rwanda has over 60 percent women in the parliament. The constitution gives a uh, 30 percentage of, of women participation in all decision-making institutions. Um, maternal health care and uh, and, uh, and uh, insurance policies are very clear and over, I think over 80 or over 90 percent of the Rwandan people have got the insurance from the medical insurance and, and that is, all these are success stories. Um, the economy of the country is, is growing I think up to 7 percent in this year when I was reading the, the papers. So the judiciary in Rwanda has been reformed and uh, we have received cases from Europe and from the International Tribunal, which means the judiciary of Rwanda is working very well. And to the extent that all the, inter the International Tribunal here and the European Court has given a green card to the judiciary and the prosecution in Rwanda, we are able to conduct fair and successful prosecutions. So just to mention but a few, those are some of the examples that shows that Rwanda is a success story and the country has moved ahead. Rwanda is, uh, is, is participating in the international organizations, Rwanda has, uh, is participating in the regional organizations on, on the level of leadership, Rwanda is participating in peacekeeping operations all over the world, one of the first, probably first five peacekeepers, uh, contributors in the whole world. Uh, Rwanda is appearing at the international fora as uh, a respected nation with, res with respected leadership. Um, at the East African level, we, we are participate, active participate, participators on the prosecution side. We are participating in the East African Association of Prosecutors, International Association of Prosecutors, the African Association of Prosecutors. So we are involved in lots of this. Um, you know Rwanda has been a member of the Security Council for two years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and all these are success stories that shows that Rwanda has moved for the last 20 years from where it was, where so many people looked at it as a failed state, mm -hmm. to become one of the success stories in the whole world. So this has been possible because of, of, of the able uh, policies uh, in the country that include the citizenry participation and uh, give rights uh, to the to the people to, to decide on how to move on with with their with their affairs, how to manage their affairs. So I would say Rwanda is a success story. My understanding is that there's been some attempts made at, at um, uh, what I think people in the U.S. would say, like blocking uh, the press or or making it not possible for the press to say certain. Thanks. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, I think that one, it depends. You, you know, I think in every country they have uh, the laws limiting the freedom of, of speech because you cannot uh, simply come and uh, deny the genocide either through the writings or either through the publications and either through audiovisual uh, presentations and expect to walk free. Mm -hmm. So Rwanda has the, its own laws that has to be respected. Rwanda is a sovereign country. So the laws in Rwanda have to be respected by the Rwandese and the foreigners. And uh, there is no anyone who would just move into another country and uh, 
start saying or writing whatever he or she wants. I think there must be regulations mm -hmm. that govern the conduct of vis-a-vis of, of, -vis the, the, that freedom of, of expression. So much as the freedom of expression is a principle that is covered by several international conventions, uh, but it, 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 it is also checked. It is also checked because hate speech cannot be tolerated and, uh, and when there is evidence for that, then investigations can be carried out. With regard to the documentary you mentioned, um, I'm really not very much informed about it. But it also goes back to, to, to the, how the peoples of the, the, the laws of the land are respected by anyone who either wants to do something or some business in that country. I cannot simply walk out of this place and start doing something that is contrary to the Tanzanian law. Uh, I would be questioned about that and I would be held accountable. So uh, critics will probably be there, but we also have to see the realities. And uh, we believe that every country as a sovereign state within what we call the reserve domain of, of any nation, there must be laws to be respected, and anything contrary to that uh, can be questioned by the authorities concerned. So I, I don't think it is the issue of trying to suppress anyone from talking. I think it is about accountability, accountability and, uh, and being responsible for what one does. So that is my view. Uh, it's my view, and uh, I, I may not share it with so many people, but, but that is probably what I think. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Well, I, I would say from the prosecution side, because I work with, I've worked with the prosecution for, for the last 16 years now, uh, I have seen the Rwandan prosecution uh, developing, reforming itself, and uh, being able now to handle international cases before domestic courts. Uh, that's a very big achievement, and this has been able because of the, the vision that we have and the abilities that we have developed uh, through development of the human resource and the infrastructure resource in the country. The Rwandan courts, the Rwandan prosecution, are now um, able to handle the challenges posed by the prosecution of international crimes. The detention issues have been resolved. We now have prisons that are recognized by the international tribunals, the international community. We even we are even housing the convicts from other countries. You know we have convicts from Sierra Leone. They are serving their sentences in Rwanda. This is a recognition by the international community on the standards that the Rwandan judiciary has reached. So I would probably end up saying that the Rwandan prosecution and the Rwandan judiciary has reached a very good uh, level that we all appreciate uh, emerging from where we came from 20 years ago, and to be where we are in such a short time is something remarkable that really we should be happy of. Thank you.